I think I thought, oh, it wouldn't be fun to do a book about apples. I know it was partly because I suppose most people didn't know more than about half a dozen apples. You go to the shops and it just seemed such a small collection of apples around. You know, you looked in the old books, which I've always loved old books, there were so many apples, you know, and orchards, and they all seemed to be going. And I've always loved painting apples, but I thought it would be nice to do a book about them. I sort of had a great conviction that that's what the world needed more than anything. And I worked on it for four years, I think, before I even went to a publisher. I just wanted to do it. I think I didn't really care if anyone was a publisher. I was just going to do it. In the end, I got in touch with the RHS at Wisley and um, met Harry Baker, who was the fruit officer then. The long and the short of it was he made a list, which was the 122 that I started with. He used to look at the paintings at the end of each season and um, tell me if any needed altering or, you know, some occasion I had to do them again because I was just going around the trees looking for what I thought was a typical apple and perhaps I might have picked it from the top of the tree and it was perhaps slightly too coloured or... Anyway, he, he was the expert and he knew exactly what it should look like, so um, that was very useful. Well, the sepals, these little sepals are at that edge, in the middle, down at the bottom. It's all, they're all different. This is a Braeburn, grown in England, which is a variety called Lock. And then, of course, they all have to be tasted. And I had to get friends to taste them as well. And make juice about them. And the cookers had to be cooked to see um, what colour they go. And uh, colour, I would say, is whether they cook to a fluff or stay whole. Slightly greenish. You've got to try and make it look like it's growing on it, you see what I mean? Which is not always easy. I want to put this um, spike on there, so I need a bigger surface. So I've got the board there, so it allows for the spike to go on there. And then it's got to have a, the view that you want. I want to use the eye of the apple on this particular bit. It's not like being out of doors and the light will change. So if I get some lighting up to start with, it means I can carry on if the light goes or in the evening or something. I have this bigger board so I can have the pellet right here and I don't have to go for searching for it. I'm going to sort of just get a rough idea of how I might do this. On a bit of tracing paper. So you don't have to be necessarily terribly literal about it, you can move the leaves around as long as it's authentic. And measure it. And the binders is very useful. Good pencil sharpener. Something like that, maybe. Perhaps I can foreshorten this a bit. Probably looks a bit fond at this stage. I often look at it and think, God, that looks really terrible, but somehow it usually, you have to just trust it in the end it'll be all right. It was coming down there and, and actually it comes a bit higher up and I thought, well it doesn't really matter but it sort of does. So I, I've just removed it and this brush is very good for removing things. It's actually an oil acrylic brush. Um, I'm just going to let that dry before I put it back in again.
This this colour is very useful. Cobalt violet. It's very good for soft reds and shadows and highlights and well, it's quite a lilac colour up here. Just building it up gradually really. Not to do too much at, at once. You know, if you get a really hard edge with a, a darker colour, actually it's very hard to get rid of it. Which is why I tend to do this sort of what I call woofling. It's my own technique. <laughs> I'm the inventor of the woofle. So if you have a slightly broken edge, it's much easier to blend it into the next bit. If somebody's watching what you're doing or you're demonstrating, it just puts you in a different place. You, you become uh, you become much more aware of what you're doing, which is not a good thing really. When you're painting, you, you're somewhere else. You're not you're thinking obviously, but you're not analysing what you're doing. It's become it's more instinctive, and that's how it should be. Once you start analysing it and thinking, well, I'm mixing this colour with that colour, and I'm doing this and I'm putting that on there. It just goes, it's not, I don't think you, you don't really want to be doing that. It's a hard thing to describe to, to people. Lady Henneker was one of my favourite ones because I know that was one I needed to do and when I went to Wisley they picked them all and there were, there were two apples left right at the top of the tree and the only ladder was one with several rungs missing and I had to get up to the top of the tree and get that those two because that's all I could get. Right, I'm going to do another view of this apple, which is Don's Delight, um, because it's quite important to show both ends of the apple. The one I painted before shows the eye, so I want to do one that's going to show the stalk. And um, it's rather hard to choose with these because they, they all look incredibly different. There will be points that um, are similar, so one has to then establish it. I like this apple because it's a nice colour and it's a good shape and size and all, but the stalk is not very good because it's broken off, so I'm going to do the stalk from that one. It's about there. Way off at this stage. My skin underneath is yellow. 